What's up, everybody, and welcome to Week 6 Flex Friday. Yes, Week 6. I cannot believe that we're already, like, I don't know, what is that, a third of the way through the regular season, Andy? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you know, the good news is we're starting to get data, you know, that's real for this year that can actually be put to use, whereas the first few weeks it's kind of just blind guessing and, you know, maybe what you see from from one week carries over, but... Yeah, I wish some of my fantasy teams were doing a little bit better at this point of the year, but you know we're we're second half teams, so we're gonna we're gonna make those adjustments and come back. Well, you'd rather be a second half team than a first half team, right? So when it Very comes true. down to it, it could be worse. So for anyone that hasn't watched, Andy and I are each gonna give you guys a couple flex plays that we really like this week. We're also gonna give you a streaming quarterback and a streaming tight end. So stay tuned after the intro. <laughs> So just before we get going today, I'm going to give a little hats off to Andy. He did beat me in our bet from last week. Now, I did win two out of the three position battles, but total points, I did lose because basically we both suck besides the Dallas Goddard pick. Everyone else (laughs) was completely useless. Hey, man, a win's a win, and I'm looking forward to that warm beer coming in the mail. Exactly. I may have to do it by horse and carriage or something. I did look up. You can't send alcohol via the mail. So maybe I'll have to tip a little messenger boy to come drop it off on your front porch. Hey, man, so. That works to me. Go, you know, go Harry Potter style. Go find an owl, or maybe a couple owls, depending on, you know, how big the beer is you want to send yeah. me and fly them up here. Maybe an armadillo all the way from Texas. Could take a while, but Ooh, yeah, you know, they got something to do. Those armadillos are, they mean business. So Andy, yeah. why don't you get us kicked off with your first flex play of the week? So I'm going to start off with uh, Tyler Boyd. Now, despite no T. Higgins last week and a pretty favorable matchup, Boyd didn't really have a great game against the Cardinals. And, you know, T. Higgins may play this week. He may not. But either way, he's still got a broken rib. And so he's not going to be 100% out there on the field. And even with Higgins in the lineup, Tyler Boyd's received seven or more targets in his last four games. He's been in for 83% of snaps. And actually his lowest snap percentage was last game, but that game just seemed to be, we're going to throw the ball to Jamar Chase to make him happy. And he is going to ball out. And that's exactly what happened. Um, But, you know, this is, it's, you know, a different team. I think um, the Seahawks play a lot of zone defense, which is where Tyler Boyd really excels. He's not great against man coverage, but against zone, at least according to Matt Harmon reception perception, that's where he really excels. Seahawks played third most zone in the league. He's been getting targets. You know, Higgins Higgins is hurt, and the Seahawks are a very exploitable uh, defense in a game that I think is going to be pretty high scoring. Yeah, I have to imagine coming off last week that the Seahawks aren't going to let Jamar Chase do what he just did. Like, there's just 0% chance you watch that film, and you're like, yeah, you know, if Jamar Chase beats us, Jamar Chase beats us. Like, no, he's going to beat you if you don't guard him correctly, so... I yeah. think that's a pretty good call, um, especially coming off last week. Boyd, great player. Um, the one thing I did notice last week with no T. Higgins is that Boyd played on the outside a lot. So I almost think Higgins being back would be a positive. You would think he'd yeah. be more of a slot player. Um, but like you said, it's going to be a high-scoring game. Um, and, you know, against the Seahawks, I don't really think there's much more to be said there. Yeah, they're 25th DVOA versus the pass. And yeah, especially if Higgins is back and almost running as a decoy on the outside, that is like the ideal scenario for Tyler Boyd to have a big game. I was thankful, I got to say, as a T. Higgins owner, that he did not suit up last week and give us that classic T. Higgins single oh, yeah. snap game from last. I remember that, where it's like he played the one snap and then he was just like, not good. And you're just <laughs> like, like, the whole rib no, injury no, thing. Hurts. I just was glad this happened. So I'm actually going to go to the same game for my first wide receiver here. And that's going to be Tyler Lockett. Um, Just to go off what you said, Cincinnati's offense came out, looked like themselves last week. I think this is going to be a really high scoring game. 
Um, it can be tough to predict which Seattle weapon is going to get the touches in that offense. But I just think this profiles is a very good situation for Tyler Lockett. They're going to have to throw the ball. They're coming out of the bye where they're probably going to try to get their receivers going. Um, and just like a little note, we usually talk about the over-unders, right? 45 over-under for the game. That's pretty high. But Tyler Lockett's receiving over-unders at 51 and a half. Like, that's pretty high for a guy that is being considered, like, not a top 20 wide receiver play at the moment. So yeah. that just seems pretty safe. And, you know, Tyler Lockett is going to have some bad games. He's not necessarily a floor player at the moment. But he has a massive ceiling, especially if he gets going against Cincinnati. Yeah, no, I like this play. And looking it up here, the Bengals are fourth in DVOA versus wide receiver ones, but 20th DVOA versus wide receiver twos. So it seems like they can lock up the one fairly well. You know, I would still definitely play DK Metcalf because he's a monster, but I think this is a great matchup for Tyler Lockett. Yeah, I love it. So let's move on to our next guy for the week. So for me, and now it really kind of depends on if he plays or if he's healthy, but I'm totally fine pivoting to the backup. And that's either Jeff Wilson or Salvin Ahmed. Um, you know, Mostert is an absolute smash play this week. The um, Carolina is 32nd in their rush defense DVOA. And Miami is first in both rushing offense DVOA and first in their see what's it called again? uh adjusted line yards which is basically a grade for their offensive line i mean they've been opening up huge holes and their super speedy running backs have been absolutely destroying it you know in a game where they're favored by multiple scores here you know this could get ugly really early um you know i think Mostert, he's getting old and he's still producing really well but you know if they're up by 17 points in the second half they're gonna be letting these backups get opportunities and against this defense it gets, you know, it's a team that seems broken being 0-5. It's in Miami. It's a home game. Um, I think both these backups are are solid plays, or at least whichever one's going to play. You know, if Jeff Wilson's like, I'm fully healthy, I'm off IR, I'm good to go, I'd play him. You know, they might not even activate him. Or even if, you know, he's still limited dealing with his ribs, then I'm fine playing Salvin. Yeah, I think that's a good call on the thought that they're probably not going to push Mostert to the extreme. I think that's a, just – it just seems like almost too logical. Like he's been kind of running as like a 50% snap share guy most of the season, whether it's been sharing with, you know, obviously HN the last couple of weeks or even earlier in the season, he wasn't getting all of the touches. Now I'm definitely crossing my fingers. It's Jeff Wilson, as I'm sure you are as well. Yeah. Just because Jeff Wilson's like a better player than Salvin Ahmed, even though he's a fine backup, I think in that system. Yeah, I think the way that they've been opening up holes, I think most running backs in the league could could do it. But Jeff Wilson's also super fast, and that's what this Miami team is built on, is being fast. Yeah, so I'm going to move on to my next guy. And this is going to be kind of what you did. I'm going to name two guys. Um, and I'm going to go Jordan Addison and K.J. Osborne here. Um, I think Jordan Addison is like, if he's been on your bench, he's an obvious start now with Justin Jefferson out. So, you know, put Jordan Addison in your lineup. This is just a reminder to people. But K.J. Osborne someone who's more, you're probably going to pick up K.J. Osborne, and you can now stream him this week. Um, it's going to be a 44 and a half over under. Um, Osborne, nine targets last week. Same with Addison. Obviously, both of them got a lot more touches after Jefferson went out of that game, especially Osborne. Um, so just, you know, no Jefferson. It's going to be a game with some bad defense I'd be projecting. And Osborne should most likely slide kind of into JJ's role in the offense. He's not going to become JJ, but I would think that they're going to let Addison just stick with his role and let him develop as that kind of counterpoint to where Jefferson plays. And Osborne should probably fill in. And, you know, when Osborne gets targets, he has been really good. Like when he's had over 10 targets, I think I read this stat the other day, he scored in like 10 of 15 games when he gets 10 targets. So even though I don't think he's a great player, I just see him getting probably like eight to 10 targets. So if you're just putting a guy in your flex position for this week, I think Osborne's as good as you can get, especially if you're like adding someone specifically this week and are being forced to play them. Yeah. And you know, bears defense 31st and past DVOA. This is where the Vikings really excel to is throwing the ball. And yeah, he's not the same player that Justin Jefferson is, but anybody can be great against this bears defense. I mean, Sam Howell threw for almost 400 yards against him on Thursday. And coming off that huge morale win, are they going to have that same 
energy coming into this game against the Vikings. They're going to be able to sustain it for two weeks. I don't think so. I I love this Miami play or not Miami yeah. Minnesota play. Yeah, for sure. So let's move on to your last flex play of the week. So this guy, you know, the other guys are a little bit more, you know, deeper, deeper leagues. This one, you know, he's going to be rostered. It's not somebody that you can just pick up off waivers, but Christian Kirk, he's uh 26 in fantasy points per game for wide receivers and half point uh, playing the Colts 30th DVOA versus wide receiver twos. And except for week one, he's been in 80% of the snaps. It seems like he's kind of their clear wide receiver too. He has been Mr. Consistency getting between 11 and 16 points per game for the last four weeks, averaging 10 targets a game. That's the 10th most in the NFL in the last four games. And, you know, one of these days he's going to combine all those receptions, those yards and actually score the one, one game where he scored, he only had, you know, 50 yards, but I think this is a great matchup where, you know, he could really be the guy and bring home a lot of fantasy points. Well, let's not forget, like, this is one of the few matchups in the league so far that's uh, going to be, like, a rematch, right? They played week one already, and Calvin Ridley just absolutely ate up Indianapolis. So you would think yeah. that would be probably pretty high on their priority list as something that they're not going to let happen again. Um, just in yeah. watching the Jaguars play, Christian Kirk moves the sticks. That is his role in that team, and it's why his targets, besides week one, which was just some weird anomaly – have been yeah. very high. Like he gets open, he gets open against man, he gets open against zone, he gets the target, and Trevor Lawrence just looks his way. Um, I'm with you. I, I've been on Kirk all season. It was actually, I felt good about myself after week one. I kind of was touting. I was still ranking Kirk up there. I was like, he'll be fine. Like yeah. I still think him and Ridley are just neck and neck more than people are trying to separate them. As good of a player as Calvin Ridley is, that offense is just sharing touches so much that I really find them as all a lot closer to each other than people think. Yeah. And Kirk's a good receiver. I mean, he finished as a wide receiver one last year in fantasy, so he can get it done. It's not like he's, you know, just a guy who's getting some targets. Like he's deserving of all the targets that he gets. I'm excited for Zay Jones to potentially come back or even sit out and finally get healthy because yeah. When Zay Jones healthy, he seems to be their deep threat, which I think will just unlock the efficiency for the Jaguars a little more. I think yeah. we expected them to score more points this year. And I think weirdly, like Zay Jones is like a pretty key piece in that offense. Even if he's not a top 15 fantasy wide receiver, I think he just really fills out their offense. So, I'm oh, Yeah, go. good call. Um, I'm going to go back to the Vikings Bears game and I'm going to go the Chicago backfield here. Roshan Johnson slash Donta Foreman. Um, honestly, best case, I think, would be Roshan sitting without, you know, with his concussion from last week and getting to just use Foreman as the guy here who showed in the past couple seasons that if he's the featured back, he can be productive, right? Yeah. Um, we are not scared of Minnesota's defense. They weirdly are better than you'd think against the run, but that's just one of those situations that when you get passed on so heavily, of <laughs> course you're better against the run because, like, you're just getting thrown all over. But when it comes to running back touches, man, it's about touchdowns. So Foreman, if he plays without Roshan, I think is a great play. Not going to be a top five guy, but I think he's a great flex in a bye week or in a pinch if you're missing someone. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I'm just going to echo everything I said for Roshan. If he does play, I think Roshan would be the guy who's probably getting 60% of the touches if it's a split. And in that sense, I'd still feel very conscious of throwing it out there. They definitely want to see what they have in Roshan with Herbert Hurt to see if he's someone yeah. who they can really rely on moving forward. So it's a good just bye week play. And it's just, there's going to be some points scored in this game. So I, I think that's what you look for. You look for touches and high over unders. And, and this kind of has both of them for the Chicago backfield. Yeah. And you know, the Vikings, they might be better against the run fantasy point wise DVOA. They're right in the middle of the pack. And like you said, it's just because teams can throw on them like crazy. And I like Roshan out of the backfield too. They've been using him as a bit of a receiver. And I think without Herbert, he might get more opportunities. You know, it's a team that's pretty thin at wide receiver outside of DJ Moore, who obviously went nuclear last week, but you know, somebody on this offense, if they're going to do anything is also going to have to make plays. I, they can't, do every game where DJ Moore gets a hundred percent of the receptions almost. The regression is real with DJ Moore and we've yeah. to see it this year. So now we're going to move on to our little streaming section of the show. So Andy, why don't you kick us off with your quarterback streamer for the week? 
All right, so it's a little bit of a two-parter, um, and it's two guys playing against each other, and it's it's kind of gross. But Sam Howell and Desmond Ritter, I would play Howell over Ritter, but you know Howell's coming off of nearly 400 passing yards against the Bears, and the Falcons are 29th DVOA versus the pass and seventh versus the run. So actually, kind of a decent run defense. Um, the the commies are coming off a long rest here, and uh, the Falcons are kind of in the middle of the pack, giving up points to quarterbacks, but they played Bryce Young in his first start, Jordan Love, who's been pretty up and down, and then the other games, the teams are winning by so much that they just tried to run the ball against them to run the clock down. So, you know, they're still terrible against guarding wide receivers. Um and Ritter in this matchup, too, is the uh, Commanders are 28th versus the pass DVOA, and they have also allowed the most rushing yards to quarterbacks this season. So it could be a little chance for Desmond Ritter to get some rushing yards in. You know, I think Sam Howell's a little bit safer. Desmond Ritter's been so up and down. And if that offense, if that team's winning, if the Falcons are up, they're going to want to just run the ball because that's the identity of their team. Whereas I think the, uh, the Commanders are going to have to pass more. So I'd still start Howell, but. You know, Desmond Ritter, I think, has a little sneaky floor potentially with, you know, if he can get some rushing going. He ran one in last week, so he's not afraid to run. And, you know, this is however they're doing their uh, their pass rush. It's leaving some some gaps for quarterbacks to scramble around. Yeah, I'm curious how the game script will work out in this one. Obviously, we saw Washington last week like they Mm -hmm. just got down super early. They gave up some really easy throws to Justin Fields. So, like, everything you're saying about being able to throw on Washington makes a lot of sense, right? Like, yeah, DJ Moore was wide open a couple times and yeah. everything. I think the one worry would be just like you mentioned, if Atlanta gets up and it's not because of Desmond Ritter, watch it just be 40 out of 50 runs to, to end the game off. But, yeah. you know, that's, that's too much projecting in some cases, right? We really don't know exactly what's going to happen. And a lot of times when you get to average to bad teams, those games can weirdly bore, be more high scoring than you would think. Um, so I would tend to lean Howell, just like you said. Yeah. But in a pinch, Ritter, QB2, you know, he did look better last week compared to two weeks ago where it looked like he might be out of the NFL within the next month. So um, I don't hate it. Um, I'm just going to do my tight end quickly just because it ties in so perfectly. And that's going to be Logan Thomas at Atlanta. Um, right. Last week, 11 targets, nine catches, 77 and a touchdown. Atlanta's 30 against the tight end, 30th against the tight end fantasy wise. So it's a great matchup. I mean, when it comes to streaming a tight end, the fact that Logan Thomas has the ability to get nine catches, even within his range of outcomes, really should be enough for you to consider him if you're looking for a tight end, right? He looked pretty good last week. They ran him on some deeper routes. Um, maybe he's just getting a little healthy because he was kind of banged up to start the year. And as much as we love Jahan Dotson, he really hasn't fully taken over as the number two in that offense yet. So maybe it is just Logan Thomas for now. McLaurin looks absolutely great. I don't think his stats really tell the full story. He gets about like two pass interference calls on him on deep shots every single game that if you gave those both to him, he would be absolutely going off now that they're helping his team, but they're not showing up. Yeah. No. And I, yeah, I like Logan Thomas just as a player too. Like anytime he's been in and been healthy, it seems like he's been able to produce It's his big problem is just dealing with all sorts of injuries over his career. But yeah, I think this is a great matchup for him. So let's move on to your tight end and then we'll double back to my quarterback for the week. All right. So we're going right back to the well, right where we were last week. And you know, he didn't have a great game, 10 yards, but he fell into the end zone sometimes it's all you need to get tight end 11. He was a top 12 tight end last week with 10 yards. And that's Zach Ertz. Um, You know, the Rams are 30th DVOA against the tight end. They absolutely just got shredded by Dallas Goddard last week. And, you know, Zach Ertz, he still played 75% of snaps. For some reason, both the other tight ends had more yards than him. So they do want to throw to the tight end. Um I just think it, you know, could have been a weird little thing. He only had four targets, but still played most of the snaps. He's still top four in targets to tight ends this year. You know, all tight ends outside of, you know, three guys, you're kind of just rolling the dice and hoping that you hit something. And, you know, he's got a great matchup. He's getting targets. 
this is actually a sneaky, decent offense this year. So that is so funny. I hadn't even like, I was watching red zone last week and I saw Zach Ertz score and I was like, nice call, Andy. I did not even realize that he only had 10 yards in addition to the score, but look, he got the score, which makes a tight end a good play. If they score, (laughs) I will take that every single week. Uh, So my quarterback, I don't know how we happen to do this. Totally on accident. Same game, actually. That's going to be Matthew Stafford. Um, 48 and a half over under in this game, which is crazy high. Arizona, 30th pass defense fantasy wise. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the thing that I'm leaning on with Stafford here is last week, he had 37 pass attempts in only 22 minutes of possession playing the Eagles. So the fact that they barely had the ball and he threw that much. I think if that can be even an even split, just like, you know, 30 to 30 when it comes to just ball control, I think Stafford's going to throw the ball 40 times with Cup back. They're just going to pass more would be my guess. They probably ran more without Cup. And now that Cup's back, he's probably going to let it just unload a little bit more. Um, He does only have two touchdowns in one game all season throwing the ball, but that did come last week. So I think if you're talking about maybe he's on the up with his favorite target coming back, I think Stafford's a pretty good play. I mean, yeah, Stafford with Cooper Cup and the emergence of Puka Nakua. Now they have two awesome wide receiving options out there. Like, I think this is a great offense to get behind, especially in this game. I was just excited to see that offense last week. Just like that drive came out and it's just like Cooper Cup, Cooper Cup. Cooper yeah. Cup, and you're like, oh, okay, no, he's, he's fine, dude. He's yeah. fine. Yeah, like he he feels great. So uh, it'll be exciting to see what they do with both these weapons because even Puka got one. So I think that's just good news moving forward for the offense in general. Um, and uh, you know, not really too concerned that Van Jefferson is leaving. Um, I, I did see like a joke tweet that someone said, mm-hmm. and it was just like uh, Rams, or it was it was Falcons Super Bowl odds. 8,000 to one Falcon Super Bowl odds after acquiring Van Jefferson, 8,000 to one. So yeah. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. That's just to sum that one up. But yeah. what's your game that we should be targeting this week, Andy? Well, it's the one we were just talking about, and that's the Cardinals and the Rams. Like you said, 48 and a half point over under. Um, Cardinals are 10th in offensive DVOA. Rams are 9th in offensive DVOA. Both are top 10 in pace of play as well. So these are two offenses that just want to keep the ball moving. Uh, They want to, you know, push the pace, which is great for fantasy. More plays means more potential for points. Cardinals are kind of like you said, 30th in fantasy points per game, 30th in defensive DVOA. The Rams are 27th in defensive DVOA. So it's two offenses that are playing really well right now. Two top 10 offenses, top 10 pace, bottom five defenses. And, you know, they're bad against both the pass and the run. So I think, you know, pretty much all the players on the Rams that you would start, start them. Uh, I think 2 is a guy you can even, if you're desperate for a flex play, I think I'm playing him in one league, played him last week, love the touchdown. Um, you know, I think, like you talked about last week, Michael Wilson, he could have a bounce back game here. The Cardinals are a terrible matchup and, you know, it's just rookies. They're going to be up and down. So the only thing I'm a little concerned about is Keontae, Ingram coming back, you know, he was named the starter on the depth chart. I think I would still play Di Mercado. You know, he flashed and it looks like he's a better player, but it's also tough to say what the coaching staff's going to do there, whether it's going to be 50 50 or, you know, maybe they're going to go with a veteran to start out and see how the game goes. So it's a little sketched out there, but, you know, Zach Ertz, Hollywood, super desperate, throw Josh Dobbs in there, see what happens. But, yeah, I mean, 48 and a half point over under. I don't know. Yeah. It's about what say. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I think this week is a funny one. Like, this is probably the least amount of games we, we have talked about. Because I'm going to move on to my game of the week here, and it's going to be Cincinnati versus Seattle. Like, we've already mentioned players from all of these teams we've talked yeah. about. But that's what makes sense. That's what you do with flex positions, right? 45 yeah. over under for the Cincinnati-Seattle game. Uh, really, yeah, not going to dig in too much of this. Lots of weapons, right? Both QBs. Both Arby's, Chase, Metcalf, Lockett, maybe even JSN coming out of the bye. I would love to see him get a little more involved, potentially. Um, so just play your guys in this game. I don't know if I'd love to play JSN. I think just as a dynasty owner, we'd love to see him show a little more spark or just be a different piece in the offense. Um, yeah, it's I think tough one to thing- catch those passes for 
two yards and then have immediately have a guy there to tackle him. It's like, come yeah. on. I, I do think some of the announcers have actually done a good job in watching some of these Seattle games that they've pointed out that because they're missing both of their tackles, they've been going like two or three tight ends a lot of time and keeping them yeah. in the block, which is keeping JSN off the field. So I do yeah. think that's an interesting point, and I would love to see if they get a little healthier on the offensive line if that changes. But, you know, only time will tell. I think we all believe in JSN's talent. We're just going to wait for it. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in to Week 6 Flex Friday. Hopefully Andy and I are a little better this week. I think last week was probably just our worst all-around week. But, you know, sometimes fantasy be like that. You can't be right all the time. We're all just, you know, taking our best guess, and then all of a sudden – you play Jordan Love and you lose six points from his interceptions and everything. But, you know, that's what had happened. So, Andy, any last notes for everyone before we get out of here? Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice that I don't have to watch the Packers get destroyed this week because they're on a bye. So that's that's what I'll leave with. And, you know, it might be a while before I recommend any Packers. This team, team looked good, and, man, they have not the last few weeks. But, hey, they're young. So we'll defense see. looks okay, weirdly. Like this defense, no. they haven't been allowing a bunch of points, but that is what it is. So thank you guys for tuning in, and we will catch you next week, Flex Friday.